what I want to talk about is is system science approach, and, and really this is uh, the, the the framework in which uh, dynamic modeling appears. Uh, I want to talk about system science as a science as a whole, and um, and talk about uh, three types of uh, or shared characteristics of dynamic models, and then three types of system science models. Okay. Um, so uh, the motivations here lie for COVID-19 and ever more complex health policy challenges. Um, but really, this is, this is not sp something specific to COVID-19 or something specific to health policy. It's, look, um, throughout modern society, we're grappling with ever larger challenges uh, as a society, whether it comes to uh, global climate change, whether it comes to issues of interlinked economies, and development, whether it comes to issues of interlinked um, populations in terms of spread of infection. Um, uh, we have a really a set of, of challenging issues whose scale is growing ever larger. And this is true with computer systems as well. And computer systems are long, longer systems of just computers, but uh, systems which involve people as a key, key factor. Think social media, for example, where people's reactions to it form part of the ecosystem. Um, and uh, what, what um, distinguishes a lot of these challenges are that they are not merely um, technical problems which can be studied and managed by understanding their pieces, the, their various components in isolation. Rather, they exhibit features that are in technical sense complex in the sense that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, okay? It's different from the sum of the parts. Sometimes it's worse than the sum of the parts, but, but it, it's distinct from. Um, it just like, look, you, a traffic jam is composed of cars, which are composed of axles and engines and doors and, you know, tailpipes and so on. But a traffic jam is not just a bunch of axles. To, to explain traffic jams, to abate traffic jams, prevent them, we can't just talk about, you know, axle sizes and, you know, tire spacing and, and the, uh, the turning radius of the vehicles. It's a lot, it's about a lot more than that. It's about interaction between these vehicles. It's about visibility. It's about, you know, the ways they bunch up and et, et cetera. The fact that one can't go in front of another that's right in front of it, et cetera. Um, so look, in dynamically complex systems, these systems that are technically complex, which, which are basically most of the systems that, that are really gnarly to deal with in today's society, the behavior of the whole can be very distinct from the parts. And if we're trying to manage the whole, limit the damage the whole does um, to us, uh, if we're trying to abate it or prevent problems, uh, we need to, to grapple with that whole. These systems react, it's, it's hard to do that because the systems react surprisingly and pervasively to intervention. We focus on one part and it ends up popping out on another. Um, and, uh, you know, if we, we go to, seek to lower the burden of COVID-19 within our province, um, there's any number of different ways we could intervene and one's gonna affect others. We can do hospital screening as people come into the hospital, try to find undiagnosed infectives. We can do mass drive-through screening sites. We can do higher levels of contact tracing. Uh, we could have broader distribution of contact tracing apps. We can engage in um, large scale public messaging. We can have lockdowns. And any one of these is going to affect the, the flow of people seen by the others. It's going to limit the impact or en enhance the impact of the others. Uh, within these systems, if you poke in one place, it pops out in another. And look, the, the link between cause and effect within these systems is often unclear. Um, uh, often we have delays, you know, so you have holiday gatherings, and then a couple weeks later, you have a a big increase in the number of, of reported cases, for example. Um, there's delays associated with that reporting and even bigger delays associated with hospital um, appearance or, or appearance in ICU, the intensive care unit, or, or people tragically passing away. And um, uh, these effects are often reciprocal. A influences B and B influences A. And they're nonlinear. And, and we're gonna see in technical terms what that means. But um, it's, it's a situation where you can't, uh, to understand the response of a system um, to 
uh, the system as a whole. You can't simply sum up its response to each of the pieces. Um, and in these systems, you know, the tail often wags the dog. Certain subgroups, maybe it's um, young people going to uh, parties and, and gatherings. Maybe it's, um, maybe it's individuals who are um, engaged in high risk behavior from the point of view of travel. They have a disproportionate impact. The tail can wag the dog. Uh, there's different effects at different scales. Um, and, you know, prevention can often have a disproportionate effect down the road. And we work on a wide variety of these things. Emergency departments are one, one area we've delivered for the province, the opioid epidemic, another antimicrobial resistance. And all of these share the fact that, look, you intervene at one place and, you know, you often trigger effects you don't fully anticipate and that take time to play out. And sometimes they whack you on the side of the head. You know, if we look at something like COVID-19 and we look at, for example, um, you know, New York City uh, counts here. We have here, you know, uh, showing hospitalized individuals that's in, in, in yellow, um, uh, test positivity, the fraction of people tested that are positive. Uh, we have here new test volume. You can see the number of tests over time is going up, number of people on ventilation, um, and new cases in, in brown here. And all of these things are interlinked. They're all tied at the hip they're all intertwined and entangled in a way that, that really poses a problem for understanding what's going on and what can we do to, 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 to make it less of a problem. Um, the same thing comes up in Saskatchewan, um, you know, where we have total numbers of tests over time, you know, travel required cases, hospital, number of people in a hospital overnight, number of new hospitalizations, cumulative deaths, and all of these things are entangled in this way that makes your eyes glaze over if you just look at the data. But what we're really talking about here in this class is what lies under the surface. This is the tip of the iceberg. And it's often what we don't see that's, that's the bigger challenge, okay? Um, so traditionally, the way science has worked over many centuries until you know, the past 50, 50 years-ish and, and really the past 25 years, is a reductionist approach. We take things apart. We, we divide things up. We understand their pieces in hopes that that will tell us how the system as a whole works. And you know that brought us a great deal of insight, but it often doesn't give that understanding about the whole system works. Just because we sequence the human genome doesn't tell us you know, how to lessen the burden of diseases, for example. Um, knowing how each piece in a cell works doesn't tell us why the cell develops cancer, for example. Um, and we need to, we need a, a level of inquiry that's, that puts the pieces together, okay? So traditional techniques um, have real trouble doing this. Statistical techniques, techniques divide, that, that are based in this divide and conquer method associated with uh, reductionist uh, science. And uh, they have real problems when you're dealing with bi-directional feedbacks, A influences B and B influences A. So, you know, cases, the number of people uh, getting, you know, getting uh, COVID will influence the number, the risk perception for getting COVID, which influences in turn through people's behavior, the number of people getting, getting uh, COVID anew, for example. Um, these challenges also make it really difficult to reason between what you see at the person level and the society level, and to understand if we want to achieve a certain set of goals in terms of lowering the burden at a societal level, what does that mean in terms of how we have to intervene at a personal level? Um, and there's all these causally tangled health disparities. It makes it very challenging to understand you know, how, to, uh, how to interpret uh, this, uh, this data uh, properly. Um, now, a, a key need here is evaluating the impact of novel interventions um, and in planning, like how many hospital beds do we need? Do we need the field hospitals? Um, uh, how many uh, ventilators do we need for our province going forward? Um, and anticipating behavioral responses to interventions. Often we're, we're operating here like blind men and the elephant. We each you know, grab a piece of it, we're familiar with that piece, 
and we believe the whole elephant is like that, and we miss the fact that the elephant is, is not just our piece. It's not just the piece grabbed by any one person. It's the interaction between these things, okay? Um, and uh, scientifically, um, this has been a major challenge uh, within, um, uh, within the scientific community that led to the rise of system science. But at the level of decision-making, it's a problem at two different levels. One is to understand what's going on. You interpret data, like that data on COVID-19, uh, data from patterns noted uh, from 1700s for things like bubonic plague or for, um, for childhood infectious diseases here in Canada. This from Saskatchewan with measles and mumps. Uh, this from England and Wales with pertussis, whooping cough. Um, and people noted these, these, these complex patterns. People have noted them for things like spread of obesity or, or, or sexually transmitted infections, spread of zoonoses like rabies. Um, and even interpreting, you know, is a growth in cases, say for COVID, here for STIs, is that a, for sexually transmitted infections, is a growth of cases uh, a bad thing? It's a sign that more and more people are getting in it. It's a, it's a crisis. Or is it a good thing because we're, we're finding people who otherwise were hidden? You know, even interpreting whether this is good or bad news um, requires reasoning about what's going on under the surface. And a lot of what the challenge here is we have empirical observations. We have some theory of what's going on in the world. And we kind of, in our heads, we try to put together the theory and say, OK, what is this empirical data telling us about what's going on in the world? We try to say, does this? theory jibe with this empirical data? Would I see that empirical data if this certain theory is true? And it's really hard for us if we do it in our head. Even the most, you know, the most brilliantly uh, insightful mathematicians, computer scientists, people of a profound grasp of the mathematics are really bad at doing this with even moderately complex systems. But a bigger challenge, yeah, and a challenge for all of our decision makers has to do with how to intervene. You know, we got to make decisions. At the end of the day, we need to know, do we order those 100 extra ventilators or not? Are we going to need them? Do we need to lay out $15 million for the field hospitals? Yes or no? Um, are, are we going to renew the lease for the field hospitals? Um, are we going to uh, need to expand our test volume? Um, you know, how many doses of vaccine are we likely to need? Um, when you try to make decisions in the world, um, we have to grapple with these challenges. We have to put the pieces together and ask, what does this, what does this mean? What is it telling us about where things are going? What is it telling us about what choices would be the highest leverage? And whatever you condition you look at, and I've worked on dozens of, of these health conditions to help inform decision making. Um, from chronic to infectious, uh, long, you know, lifelong or short-term childhood infections, uh, older age. We're dealing with, with similar patterns of daunting complexity and you need to make sense of them. Um, one of the biggest challenges here is, is nonlinearity. It's so in fact, look, it's not a matter of knowing which is the best strategy to fight it in isolation, because often we're looking for portfolios, how to combine them. And the impact of any one strategy in isolation, um, uh, if we sum that up to consider two strategies, may be very different from the effect of combining them in practice. Um, for example, vaccinating sometimes just one more person can drive a circulating infection out of, out of the population. We reach herd immunity um, and it, it's driven out of the population. Um, uh, sometimes early intervention can head off you know, effects that would be massively more expensive to deal with, uh, with after the fact. Um, here, we're, we're seeking some desired outcome. We have some theory of what's going on in the world, and uh, we have possible choices we can make about what to do. And somehow in our heads, traditionally, relying on informal reasoning and writing a description of what we think will happen, we're gonna to try to figure out if it will achieve the desired outcome. This tends not to work very well at all. Um, and the results are writ large. If you look over the last few centuries, particularly the last century and even the last four years in the States particularly, um, 
you know, with misperceptions, surprising behavior, you get bitten in the butt, you know, uh, by things you didn't expect. Um, uh, you thought you were making a sensible decision, but it comes back to, to haunt you. Uh, you have policy resistance situations where, you know, you're just not getting any leverage just by dumping lots of money into it. Um, and you have problems learning from experience, coordinating, planning, and deciding, et cetera. Um, and there's lots of cases of this writ large in, in health elsewhere. Um, and one of the biggest challenges, right, you, you know, you, you, you solve, you think you solve one problem, but you, you create other problems. You end up shifting the, the risk to someplace else. You end up worsening the situation by, um, by causing another fire. Um, uh, lots of cases of this. Um, and all too often we find ourselves like King Canute. Anyone know the story of King Canute? Anyone a student of medieval English history who, who can tell what, uh, what, what's going on in this scene? I'll take that, ladies and gentlemen, that silence as a no, um, um, rather than as sleeping. Um, so uh, King Canute was, uh, had a lot of bad advisors and they basically told them, hey, look, um, you, can, you can do anything you want in your kingdom. Um, uh, anything you order will be the case. Um, and he was actually skeptical. This, this, this uh, gesture, grand gesture doesn't indicate it. And he said, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, uh, and they said, yes, everyone's willing to obey your command. He said, look, okay, there's lots of things that are not under my command though, um, that I don't have control over. There's the nature of things I got to work with them, like ordering back the tide. And they said, no, the tide will obey your command. Um, and so he said, well, just watch. So they brought him down to the seashore and he he, he forbade the tide from coming in. And guess what? It came in because um, he didn't accord with the nature of things. He didn't accord with uh, the underlying causal structure of the system, the rules of the game, as it were. And um, King Canute um, is emblematic, uh, you know, of a lot of, um, a lot of problems in the world. People don't realize the causal structures they're working with. And so they end up banging their head against the wall trying to make progress uh, uh, against something um, in a way that's not in the nature of things. It just doesn't accord with the way the world works. And uh, sometimes the way the world works is not a matter of the tide in some impersonal way. It's how people react. It's how, how um, other actors in the system like uh, corporate entities or, or other governments react. Um, and, uh, if we're acting in ways that don't consider the feedback for our actions, the ways in which those actions of ours stir up uh, responses, we're often going to be, you know, getting a bloody head because we're we're hitting our head against a brick wall. Um, and really, this class is about methods to have a less bloody head to to be able to better understand um, the underlying structure of a system, so that we're not banging our head against the wall. So that when we undertake action, we can do so in a way that's most efficacious, do so in a way that will achieve the highest leverage, and do so in a way, ladies and gentlemen, that will be most cost effective, that will use greatest bank, uh, secure the greatest bang for the buck. Okay, so um, really, you know, to address these needs, there arose uh, within the past, uh, 30 or so years, especially, and I've been privileged to be party to um, a great deal of that, the science of the whole, this system science, what's sometimes called complexity science. And really, this is a, a discipline uh, to visualize, understand, reason about underlying processes in the system. Some people say complex systems, which is what I've been describing, okay? Um, and to test the consistency of our understanding with evidence. Um, and a central way we do that is through dynamic models. It's these models characterizing the evolution of the system over time. By representing sort of how parts of the system work, these models can help serve as thinking tools, um, test our thinking, subject our thinking, which often has cherished prejudices and, you know, sort of, um, sloppiness in, in understanding things. By, by testing that 
in the crucible of 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 empirical evidence, but uh, but of um, the need to be consistent in our reasoning, and allows us uh, when we formulate these models to share our assumptions with others. Okay. So the models serve as these thinking tools. It's not that the model is correct. It's that the model can more quickly, when used properly, point out when our thinking is off base and allow us to debug our thinking. There's many uh, components that motivate this sort of approach at a technical level. Feedbacks, nonlinearity, uh, disproportionate effects of heterogeneity, emergent effects, uh, effects at, at different scales, net presence of networks, and and geographically mediated effects. And, and we'll see those um, all within the course of the, uh, of the, uh, of, the of this uh, course, of the course of the course, sorry, uh, the, the, in, in, in terms of the progress of the course. Um, uh, so uh, I wanna talk now though about this particular tool this, of dynamic models that forms a, a broader component of system science. System science is a broad discipline and involves many other components. Uh, complexity science has many uh, additional lines that we explore in our research group, but uh, which uh, lie outside the scope of, of this course. Um, uh, but this course, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully that will wake some of you up, is, is about dynamic models, okay? Um, it's about these models that are, often informally termed simulation, but they're simulation over time, okay? Um, and really we can view these models as capturing, mark my words, please, uh, capturing in a precise, unambiguous fashion, ladies and gentlemen, a computational fashion, computational precise fashion. Um, we operationalize these models in a way that captures our hypotheses about the world. We sharpen our hypotheses. We take, put a stake in the ground and we say, look, um, suppose this were the case in the world. Um, we make it precise in a model, needed to make it run, needed to make it enact the simulation. Um, and thereby we, we've taken a stance about advanced a working hypothesis for what might be going on in the world. And then we can test the degree to which it's consistent with empirical evidence and to what it means in terms of our choices or in terms of, 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 of our thinking. Does, does, it, does it jive with our observations? Does it jive with uh, the experience of other stakeholders? Um, and uh, often then, once we develop confidence in a model, we'll use it to test counterfactuals, things that have never been observed. We test it against empirical evidence for things that have been observed. And then we ask, well, what would this tell us if we were to undertake something that's never been undertaken before, like a lockdown uh, within Saskatchewan, okay? Um, so these are tools for refining our mental models. And, um, and by putting it in this way, we invite critique. That's a good thing. That's how we advance our learning. We invite scrutiny. We invite... Um, improvement, we invite refinement, we support the sharing of ideas more than if it's trapped in our head. Okay. Um, these models are best used in a way that communicates to invite critique, to invite feedback from stakeholders. We often build these ways, these models in ways that are transparent visually, that, that capture some, some assumptions about what's going on in the world according to a certain structure that is uh, made clear. And uh, over the course of this, um, this uh, set of lectures, uh, we're going to be seeing different ways of describing this structure. The language of stocks and flows, the language of state charts like this and events and so on, and the language of um, uh, discrete event workflows. Um, we put these models together in ways that characterize our assumptions uh, allow others to, to say when we're missing pieces or, or give feedback and which help us reason about the behavior. Um, so uh, these models are, tend to be best used if they're visual and tend to be, um, uh, tend to be uh, very helpful in stakeholder interaction. Um, 
and often they're they're pursued in a in a social context where we build them informally and um, in, in a collective way and then uh, enact them. Okay, so let's talk about, so this is all about models. This is all about structure. This is about sort of characterizing what we think might be going on out there. But thus far in these slides, I haven't talked anything about enacting it, operationalizing it over time. And that's what simulation is about, okay? We, we basically take this depiction, this posited, thinking about this world, this work hypothesis about how things might work in the world. And, um, and we basically say, go figure, you know, go, go tell us what the logical consequences of this would be over time. If this is the structure of opioid driving, um, opioid use within Saskatchewan, um, and opioid overdoses and, and switch from legal to illegal forms of opioids, um, we could say, well, go go play out what the what the implications of that would be. If th if that's what's going on out there, what would I expect to see in terms of number of chronic pain patients uh, who who are seeking opioids? What would it what would it be in terms of number of overdoses or amount of dealer activity going on, et cetera? Or we could do a similar thing with our COVID-19 models and ask what will we expect to see on number of undiagnosed individuals, number of people getting newly infected? What would I expect to see in terms of things I can compare against? Things like the number of people in hospital overnight or the, the number of people who are newly admitted to the intensive care unit. So, so these models um, help us by running them and asking what if questions, particularly questions about things we've never observed before, like, like policy choices, um, like what level of public health order restriction should we put into place later this week? You're just influencing that Sunday night. Um, these models help us understand, you know, what the trade-offs are. They help us better understand how soon we might see effect. How big might those effects be? What, would the major, what are the major uncertainties that govern whether or not we see fruitful effect? How do we know sooner rather than later whether it's, it's um, making a difference? Okay, time is running on. Let's talk about these dynamic modeling characteristics. I think we're in for a soft landing here within time, I'm happy to see, but uh, we, we need to keep up the pace, as will be, ladies and gentlemen, the case for this course as a whole. Um, so um, what are these dynamic models? Okay, they're a bunch of pretty pictures from what I've shown you. Well, okay, maybe not so pretty always, um, uh, but um, they are uh, they are structures that whether you make it explicit or not are mathematical models, they, 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 they have some mathematical structure. Um, they're sometimes termed that explicitly, sometimes termed causal models, but there's a wide range of other names given to them in different contexts. Um, and, and look, a, a rose by a different name is just as, smells just as sweet. Um, the goal for these models, by whatever name they go, whatever sub-discipline, agent-based modeling, discrete event simulation, system dynamics modeling, the goal is to examine dynamic behavior resulting from some hypothesized causal structure. And we call these mechanistic models because they don't depict correlation. They don't just depict things that happen to be associated with each other statistically. They depict posited what thing influences another thing, what thing impacts another thing, what thing changes another thing. We use, a, we use different terms for it. So in a sense, you could say these depict the, the posited physics of the system. What's driving what? Okay. Um, and all of them, mark my words, a key point, a testable point. Mm. Um, they simulate the step-by-step -step evolution of the state of the system over time. Okay. Um, they depict a micro world. I, I opened my remarks by, by noting a micro world. Uh, each of these has sort of a micro world that it, it posits at any one time and it simulates that micro world and that's evolution over time. Um, uh, step in a step-by-step -step fashion because for reasons having to do with um, Turing completeness and so on, the only way you're going to simulate is, the only way you're going to characterize it is by simulation. We can't derive a, 
a closed form formula for how it's going to change. We have to simulate it step by step. Um, uh, these systems capture posited causal pathways by which A influences B or A influences B, C, D, E, um, and B influences C and E, et cetera. Um, and as such that you can ask what if questions that have never been seen before. These sorts of simulations are used elsewhere. We'll, we'll have lots on COVID-19 and health examples, but they're, they're used extensively, you know, from prosaic things like driver training to climate policy, to pilot decision-making, to street and traffic flow um, uh, simulation to, to understand uh, the parameters for street design and, and civil engineering to um, coordinating large scale projects in the construction area. And how do these fit in? Well, you may remember, ladies and gentlemen, um, that uh, we, I argued before that when we rely on informal reasoning, trying to understand what underlying parts of the system give rise to empirical observations is hard. But you know, if we have a model we can basically say, look, okay, we have this underlying hypothesized situation. What dynamics are generated by that, would be generated by that? If that's how it is, um, what, is what are the implied dynamics? And we can test to what degree those would give rise to observations like we see empirically. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to interventions, rather than struggling in our head to put all the pieces together, how would drive through test sites interact with, you know, enhanced hospital screening and enhanced contact tracing, um, but rolling back our efforts at, um, at testing in schools, how would those all interact? We can actually have a model that, that simulates them and we can say, okay, to what degree, if, if this model is reasonably accurate, and it's probably gonna be more accurate than our head, um, to what degree would it get to the desired outcomes, right? Um, doing this informally is hard, doing it based on a model where the dynamic model is used to map from this, from the interventions and the theorized understanding to the implied dynamics, makes it far simpler. We, we basically enact this operationalizable theory, a theory that's precise enough unambiguous enough that we can simulate it over time. We can run it as a program. And we see the degree to which that match yields behavior that's consistent um, with, uh, with what we're, we're seeking. So look, models here are not crystal balls. One of the most common misconceptions that these models seek to predict the future. Now look, a model is like a prosthesis. And, and you may say, what the heck? You know, look, a prosthesis, um, crutches, uh, canes, uh, artificial legs. These are things that help us achieve near, you know, achieve high levels of functionality, walking in this case, uh, um, for example, high degree of mobility, despite our limitations. And that's what models are. They're thinking processes. They help us think more sharply, think more deeply, think more quickly, ladies and gentlemen. Um, through our choices, particularly when we have these choices with, where we have very complex things. So these models help us debug our mental models and help us do that by undertaking actions, observing results from the world. They do it by, by confronting ourselves and other stakeholders with depictions of our assumptions, but also by running those assumptions out for their implication over time in a way that's totally consistent, in a way we could never do in our head with even the most brilliant mathematicians. Um, and Einstein would be unable to do it. So the idea here actually was said by Francis Bacon um, in the 1600s. Look, truth sooner comes out of error than from confusion. Um, the modern equivalent of this is fail early, fail often. Put something forward and test, is this consistent with the evidence? By sitting back and kind of musing and, and um, and just being confused about things doesn't get you anywhere. Being skeptical and saying, I don't know what's going on. But with modeling, we can put forward a model. And you know, it's probably not correct, but it may be getting us closer to the truth because we, we sooner note where it's inconsistent and can refine our thinking. Um, so even putting forward a poor model advances knowledge by helping us spot more quickly inconsistencies between our 
our assumptions and the evidence or between our thinking and the evidence, okay? So these models are used for many purposes, asking what if questions, evaluating benefits for restructuring a system, understanding trends, understanding why we see those patterns like this. What is it that, that lies behind these uh, finding and understanding that hangs together in, all the, in terms of all these different uh, lines of evidence and understanding um, uh, how we can learn from what went on in Saskatoon to better inform you know, COVID-19 control in Swift Current or in Black Lake or in La Ronde. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a common misconception that, that models require complete data availability. Um, uh, it, it actually varies uh, a lot by models. Uh, all these models involve evolving states, some underlying situation that changes over time. The models specify incremental rules for incremental changes in that state. System behavior is emergent um, from that. Uh, we, we give these rules. The rules are given differently for system dynamics modeling, where they're given a set of differential equations for uh, agent-based modeling, where they might be associated with transitions between states and state charts, one or more state charts, or discrete event simulation, where there are times in, in different uh, blocks and, and transition probabilities. Um, but uh, in all these cases, what emerges is something very different from what's uh, put in in terms of the pieces for any nonlinear uh, system. And you can't predict ahead exactly what it will do. Um, rather, you have to run it to find that out. Okay. Um, and this yields these phenomena in the models that match phenomena in the world where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. The um, closing analogy I'd like to leave you with is look, we're not after perfection here. Models are like maps, models reflect like maps abstractions of the feature of the world around us. Um, like maps, they simplify, they throw out a huge amount of detail. And what detail they throw out is specific to their purpose. If we're seeking to take the bus across Saskatoon, we'll use a different map than if we're seeking to drive across Saskatoon, or if we're seeking to walk, or if we're seeking to bike across Saskatoon. And that's a different map yet, different sets of maps yet, than if we want to understand why flooding is occurring, you know, in uh, a certain area off of White Swan Drive. Um, like maps, models are specific to purpose. Um, what details we omit will be, will reflect how we want to use the artifact. And all models like maps are wrong, but they can be very, very useful for the purposes. They're wrong in the sense that they're not a perfect depiction of the world. Um, and indeed, if you depicted the world properly, you'd have a hard time fitting it on your smartphone. Um, so uh, uh, models always involve uh, abstraction. Um, and uh, model scope is going to be one of these things we keep on looping back to, to determine how to, um, to best uh, build models and best navigate uh, between having too much detail and too little detail. Um, OK, um, uh, so simulation modeling um, laid out here is a technique for allowing us to inform decision making in the world. Um, in my view, as Winston Churchill said about democracy, to inform decision making in many areas, it's the worst of all alternatives except for everything else. Um, there, there's not a lot of um, al effective alternatives for improving decision making um, other than, than simulation modeling. What's incumbent upon us is that we stay humble. We stay uh, ever willing to uh, admit when our models are off base and modify them and uh, to accept critique uh, of them. But so doing, we learn faster and we learn more robustly and we learn more in a way that's uh, um, more quick, uh, more, more deeply about a system. Um, and these models therefore allow us ultimately to, to, to make better decisions. Okay, that's all the material I have for today. Next time, we're gonna be diving into some, um, uh, some glimpses of uh, uh, sets of, of three major modeling techniques that we'll be seeing to equip people thinking about projects 
uh, with um, a way to, to start thinking about which approach might be a best, best match to certain needs. By Thursday, I will be posting some uh, project ideas that I'd welcome for you to look at. Um, if you have additional ideas, I'd welcome them. Um, uh, but now is the time that uh, this class has come to an end. I'd like to thank you for your uh, accommodation, for the extra time taken uh, today. I welcomed your questions earlier, but uh, I now uh, start my office hours uh, at this very channel. And I will be here for the next hour to, uh, to dialogue with any of you who may wish to, um, to learn more about the course, uh, talk about project ideas, uh, talk about expectations or otherwise engage. Bear in mind that uh, participation does reflect office hours. It reflects classroom participation, answering questions when posed. Um, it reflects attendance uh, and it reflects uh, interaction around projects, not in office hours or other meetings with me. So uh, those are ways to, uh, to secure the participation marks. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing those of you who feel this is a good ma uh, match to your needs on Thursday. Thank you very much. And I will post this recording post-haste. <laughs>